You can't have fall without football. In America, fall and football are synonymous. I mean, fall's a season, well, football's a season, right? Football is all about teams and friendly competition, right? Well, most of the time. I have an idea. What if we combine sport, food, and two cultures? Hmm. Well, today is that day. Welcome to Summer Bakes the World. I'm Summer here, baking traditional breads from around the world, providing some history and lots of tips. So join me on this journey, whether in my kitchen or yours, and together we can discover the world. Today, our bake is all about the North meets the South, in a really good way though. This is a friendly competition where two countries come together in an amazing way to create an incredible bread. The bolillo. The Mexican bolillo looks like a football. Mexico, United States, together. Bolillo is Spanish for roll, which is what the pigskin does, right? Bolillo is also known as pan francais, which comes from the French baguette, but a little smaller, and pan francais is just French bread. The bolillo is a staple eaten throughout Mexico and also Central America. You can find it in pretty much any bakery. It is eaten as sandwich bread. It's used to dunk in hearty soups and chilies. Perfect for fall, right? It's also great sliced and eaten with a pat of butter. Can't say no to that. The recipe we're using today is an authentic Mexican recipe for this roll. The links to this recipe along with the history of this bread and additional authentic Mexican recipes can be found below this video in the description. Let's look at the ingredients. This bread is about as simple as it gets when it comes to the ingredients list. We only have five. We have all-purpose flour, yeast, salt, shortening, and water. That's it. Notice there's no sugar in this recipe. Technically, bread doesn't require sugar except for to add flavor. But the reason that most recipes have sugar in them is for two reasons. One is to speed up the activation process of the yeast, and two, to act as a preservative in order to prolong the freshness of the bread after it's cooked. So this tells us two things about this recipe. One, we have to have a game plan, just like in football, and we have to prepare a starter the day before so that the yeast has time to activate overnight. And two, the bread will need to be consumed within a day or two or frozen to prolong its freshness. Like in football, we have to have a game plan and do some prep work prior to the event. So last night, I prepared the starter in order for the yeast to activate so it's ready for us today. And this is how it went. For the starter, in a medium-sized bowl, we're going to add a half a teaspoon of yeast and whisk it with three quarters of a cup of water. Mix it up really well. And then we're gonna finally add one cup of flour and mix it up as well. You wanna give this at least eight hours time to activate. Overnight, the yeast will grow and tomorrow it will have increased in size and have lots of bubbles. Mix it up really well and get those lumps out. Looks pretty smooth. Make sure you can see that. Okay, so all we have to do now is cover it with plastic wrap, let it do its magic overnight, and just leave it on the counter. So the starter I made yesterday is ready. Let's remove the plastic and take a closer look at the inside. Look at all the bubbles. Because we mixed flour with water, the flour has thickened overnight. It's increased slightly in size, but not a lot. But it's definitely activated and ready to be used in our recipe. So I'm using my mixer to combine our ingredients. But if you don't have a mixer, you can simply just use a bowl and mix them by hand. So in the mixer, we're going to add our starter from last night. And it is a pretty thick starter just because we have the, all that flour that was in it mixed with the water. So once we add the starter, we're now going to add three cups of flour and I actually already measured out the three cups of flour and we're just going to use a spoon to stir it. Remember when you're measuring flour, you want to fluff up the flour in your flour container before you scoop it in with a spoon into your measuring cup so that you don't accidentally overpack your measuring cup. To this, we're going to add two teaspoons of salt. Then we're going to add a teaspoon and a half of yeast. That's one teaspoon. And that's our half. And then we're gonna add a quarter of a cup of shortening. And I did melt it in the microwave. You should let it cool once you melt it in the microwave. I let it cool down to below 115 degrees. That way it doesn't kill the yeast. We're gonna add the dough hook and then we're going to mix everything on low 
for two reasons. One, we don't want anything to fly out of our mixer. And two, we need to allow the gluten time to develop. So remember we talked about the gluten protein and when it's mixed with water and yeast, it, even as you knead it, it has these thread-like fibers that take time to develop. That's what we have to knead for about 10 minutes when we make bread because that gluten needs that time to develop. With our mixer on low, that gives us time for the gluten to start to develop. So the last ingredient we're gonna add to the spread is water. I have one cup of water and it should be between 100 and 110 degrees and it's about 110 right now so it's just perfect where we want it. So we're just going to slowly add it to the mixer <clears throat> and let the dough hook do all of its kneading. Again if you're doing this by hand you'll just have to stir it in yourself and really that's it. So now we're going to let the mixer run for 8 to 10 minutes on low. When it's done we'll know because the dough will start to pull away from the sides of the bowl. We'll take a quick look and that way you'll know for sure it's ready. So it's actually been 10 minutes. I let it go just a little bit longer because I felt that the dough needed to pull a little bit more from the edges of the bowl. So let's take a look and see. Look at the dough as it's pulling away from the mixer. So it is a wet dough and that's okay. So let's remove the dough from the dough hook and then we'll look a little bit closer. It has started to separate from the edges of the bowl. You can see that it's just more of a nice little shaggy mess at the bottom of the bowl. And that's how you know when it's ready. The dough is ready to rise, but first we need to deflate it, shape it to a ball, and put it back into the bowl. So let me get my work surface ready. If you remember, I like to put a dish towel down. And then my favorite kneading board surface is an actual cutting board. And we're gonna take my ring off first. A little bit of flour so that our dough does not stick to the board. It is a sort of a damp dough here. Deflated, and then we're just gonna simply put this in the bowl. I like to use my big mixing bowl. We wanna spray it with cooking spray so that the dough comes out easily once it has risen. We're just gonna plop it down in the bottom there. Spray the top so that as it rises, it doesn't stick to our surface at the top. I'm going to simply place my plastic wrap over it. Then we'll stick it over the stove, over the oven. I have the oven set at 200 degrees to make it a nice warm surface and the plastic prevents drafts from getting in. We're going to let it rise for the recipe suggests two to three hours but it may not take that long. I always check 45 minutes to an hour and make the decision then. Take a look at it. Our dough has actually more than doubled in size. It's very light and airy right now. We're gonna just deflate it simply, make sure our board is lightly covered with flour. And then we're gonna do something really cool. We're gonna shape them into awesome little mini footballs. Remember, fall football season, Brad, Leo. I want you to take a look, I'm gonna flour my spatula here. Notice how much it rose, look at that. So airy, all of those strings, gluten has developed. And then of course, all of the bubbles from the yeast that has activated. And now we have our dough out on our floured surface. Let's just do a couple little kneads just to make sure that everything is, is nice and stretchy and glutinous on the inside. And you know what, that is enough. We're gonna have to divide this dough into 10 equally sized pieces. There are two ways we can do it. We can eyeball it, cut it in half so you have five and five, and then cut each half into fifths. Or we can do it the scientific way. So that's what we're gonna do, because I think that'll be fun. Trying something just a little bit different if you wanna make a more of a perfect shape, if, if you really aim for that, well, let's try the food scale. So the food scale is actually a great product. I love to use it when you're having to weigh flour and other ingredients for making accurate measurements for your bread. So here's my food scale. It's a very simple one. I turned it on, it's at zero. The last time I used a food scale, other than in baking, was when I was in college taking chemistry and had to learn how to use it then. So I'm, all, I'm familiar with tearing a food scale now. So once you put your bowl on it, it notice that the weight is accounted into the measurement, but we don't wanna do that if we're just gonna weigh our overall dough. So we wanna tear it, which takes the, the bowl weight into consideration, and it takes it to zero. I'm gonna take our dough and we're gonna weigh it. <clears throat> We get the overall measurement, which is about, we're gonna say 33.5. Okay, so we have 33.5 ounces. We're gonna divide that by 10. That's gonna be 3.35 ounces, okay? So that's how we know how big our individual dough pieces should be. We're gonna start by eyeballing the 10 pieces. My one loaf here, we're gonna divide it in half. And I am using my serrated knife, I'd love to use it to cut dough just because it cuts through easily. Now that makes five on each side. 
So just kind of knead it just slightly. Okay, same for this one since that center is a little bit wet. Okay, let's divide each into five pieces and I'm just going to eyeball it for now and then we'll add dough to it if we need to add more. So that's one, two, three, and then we'll just do this one in half. All right, so let's see how we did. I'm curious to see how, how off we are in our eyeballing. Okay, so now we have five rounds here. Let's take our scale. Okay, we're gonna turn our scale on again. I don't wanna put the food right on the scale because we do use this scale frequently. All right, so we're looking for 3.35 ounces, and that is clearly not big enough. But we're just gonna cut off a little bit more dough, add that to it. 3.32, close enough, guys, don't you think? Now, this is being super scientific. You don't have to do this. But if you have a food scale and you really want them to all look the same size, this is one way to do that. We have all 10 of our little footballs shaped into little balls. So we've got five and then four. Now I left one out because I wanted to show you a little something. Since I weighed them, this one's looking a little rough because I have little pieces that are stuck on top. To get this shaggy little ball nice and pretty again, what we're simply gonna do is just do a simple little knead of this little round and it'll get it back into a nice pretty shape so it looks like a ball that we can soon shape into a little football. All right, so now we're, that little rough shaggy mess is more of a ball now. So the next step is we're gonna leave them all here. There's a little bit of space in between them. We're just gonna let them rest for 15 minutes. Wanna cover them with a little plastic wrap, of course sprayed with cooking spray just to make sure that they can stay nice and draft free. All right, 15 minutes to let them rest. Our rolls have been resting for 15 minutes to allow the gluten to develop a little more and to rise. So guess what? It is time to play ball and form these little pigskins into the shapes that they're meant to look like, which are the mini footballs. Notice these guys have increased in size just a slightly bit. Let's remove the plastic. We're gonna remove, move them out of our way so we can work with them individually. Here's the technique. We're gonna flatten it out with the palm of our hand and it flattens fairly easily because it rose those last 15 minutes. We're gonna fold a third of it over, pinch it on the inside, and then fold it over one more time and get a nice little pinch so that the edges are sealed. It's been folded over into thirds, right? We got our edges pinched right there and we also wanna get the edges here. The technique for this is that you're gonna, if I were your hands, of course, you're gonna cup your hands like this, okay? Like you're getting water out of the faucet and drinking it, but we're gonna do it upside down. Okay, so cup your hands. You're gonna place your hands over the dough, but you want the little bit of the edges to stick out because that's gonna be the tail of our football and of our bolillo. Press down on the edges of your palms, like, you're, like towards the, the board, and then just start to slightly roll back and forth. And that cupping of your hands is going to form the ball. And then you're going to pinch the edges as you're doing this so that you're getting that little tail. And there you go. We're gonna do this for each of these. We're gonna place the seam side down. I'm taking a cookie sheet that I have lined with parchment paper. You can also grease it if you choose. And I'm just going to, to lay my bolillos in the pan. So I'm gonna do these for the rest of the, the other nine. All of our bolillos are ready. We're gonna cover up with plastic to prevent drafts. I'm just using the same plastic I've been using all day. So it's already sprayed. So if you needed to get new plastic, make sure you spray it well. But we're gonna allow these to rise in a warm space until they've doubled in volume. This could take an hour, hour and a half. We have about 15 or 20 minutes or so left before our bolillos are ready because they have risen. We're gonna put a metal pan on the bottom rack of the oven. The directions say put it on the floor of the oven, but I have burners on the floor of my oven, so I'm doing the lowest rack. This is the lowest rack that I have. So I'm gonna put a metal sheet pan at the bottom of that rack. We're gonna set the oven to 450 degrees and then let it preheat. The reason for that is when we're ready to put our bolillos in, we're gonna put a cup and a half of water in that metal pan. And when that cold water hits the heat of the oven, it's gonna create this awesome steam. And that steam is what's going to create the slight crunch that's going to occur on the outside of the bolillo. Like when you have a baguette, it has that crunchy exterior. That's what the steam's gonna do. So set the oven at 450. Okay, it's been about an hour and a half and our rolls have doubled in size. Take a look. They've been sitting over the nice warm stove for about an hour and a half 
and they are all touching now, so they are ready to go. We have one last step to do before I place them in the oven, so let me show you that now. Here is our last step before we put them in the oven. Think about it, what are we missing from these things to look like footballs? The seams! All right, so this is what you're gonna do. Just take a serrated knife. You could use a razor blade if you wanted to as well, if you don't have a serrated knife, just something sharp. I did a terrible job with the first one. The second one was a little better. So here's what I've decided to do. It's a serrated knife, so I'm gonna saw it a little bit. So we just wanna make a cut in the center, like where the seams would be on a football. You're gonna do that for all of them. All right, so there we are. We also need to spritz these with water. That again is going to create that nice crunchy crust. I don't have a spritzer, so I'm just gonna use a bowl of cold water and just put my fingers in it and then just fling my fingers with the water. And all that's just gonna do is just gonna mimic a spray bottle. However, there might be bigger droplets with my hands and with a spray bottle. You remember that pan that we put in the oven? Let's take a look at it and we'll show you what we're gonna do with that. So very last thing that we do. We're gonna take our bolillos over to the stove. Now I have a cup and a half of cold water. We're gonna pour the cold water in the metal pan that is hot and has been preheating with the oven. We're gonna put the rolls in, Let's put the water in and immediately close the door. And the cold water, meaning the hot pan, is gonna create the steam. That's gonna create the crunchiness of the rolls. Put the rolls in, pour water, cold water. And close. We're gonna cook the bolillos for 20 to 25 minutes and we'll check them to see if they're done. Okay, the oven just went off. They have been in there for 25 minutes. Let's take a look. They are nice and golden brown, the way we want them. Some of them look prettier than others, but that's okay, we're going with it, right? Because we're baking the world and we may make some mistakes. But they look awesome, look how much they've risen, and they do really look like footballs. They have the tapered ends, and then they have the seam in the center. America and Mexico, they get a pretty good match. So we're gonna let them cool for about 30 minutes to an hour, and then we're gonna break them open and taste them. All right, they have cooled. Let's take a look. Oh, it's our nice looking pile of bolillos. How beautiful are they? This one looks pretty good. Shape all around. It's got a nice little slit in the center. Listen to this crunch. If you can hear, it's just supposed to be slight. Not like a thick crunch from a, like a baguette, but it's still really soft on the inside. This is a simple bread, because remember we just really had five ingredients. So you can smell the yeast. It smells like a traditional baguette to me. It smells nice. It has a nice little stretch to it. And you can't go wrong with a yeasty bread. Yeasted bread is really tasty and smells the house very nicely. So this is a great bread. Well, since I'm gluten intolerant, and I'm not able to eat my bread, I have my husband here, Scott, who's gonna be our wonderful taste tester and describe it to us. Thanks for helping, Scott. Yeah, always happy to eat bread. <laughs> we know. All right, if you will, take a bite. Oh, can you hear that crunch? Let's give him a moment, let him taste it. Think about texture, flavors. Let him swallow. We want to make sure he can he can talk, right? <laughs> I like the crunch, but it's soft on the inside as well. Yeah, you know, the good thing about this bread is crunch on the outside, which means it's hearty for decking into soups and chilies, and then it's soft on the inside, so you can eat it with butter, Nutella, and it's just kind of a good all-around bread. Any, anything else you want to add? It's, um, it's very clean. It um, doesn't taste like there's any preservatives in it at all. Interesting he should say that. He doesn't know this, but it doesn't have any sugar in it. Remember earlier in the video we talked about sugar being a preservative? There's no sugar. It's those five simple ingredients. So for someone who didn't know what's in it, he actually nailed it. Thank you very much. He gets to eat bread. Can't say no to that. Well, there you have it. Fall, football, food equals bolillo. A great bread for the season, one to withstand fall flavors and hearty dishes like soups and chilies. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe to my channel, press the like button, and share my video with your family and friends who enjoy baking or just wanna learn something new. So until next time, go bake the world.